My name is Brendan Teeling. I'm the founder and director of the Dublin Festival of History. Our speakers today are Dr. Stefan Malinowski in conversation with Professor Robert Gerwarth. Born and raised in West Berlin, Stefan teaches modern European history at the University of Edinburgh. He's one of Germany's leading experts on the history of the German nobility in the 20th century. And his book, Nazis and Nobles, The History of a Misalliance, The Role of the Nobility in Nazi Germany, was published by Oxford University, University Press earlier this year. Robert Gerwarth is Professor of Modern History at UCD and Director of its Centre for War Studies. Robert is the author of The Vanquished, Why the First World War Failed to End. He's a great friend of our festival and has contributed to all but one of our festivals since we started back in 2013. We're delighted to have Robert back with us again. And without further ado, I'll hand you over to Robert and Stefan. Enjoy the evening. Thank you very much, Brendan, for this kind of uh, introduction. It's a real pleasure to uh, have this conversation here uh, with Stefan Malinowski. Uh, of course, on the eve of the German election, it is very topical to talk about that country and its past. Um, and no one better to explore uh, the history of Germany with than Stefan Malinowski, uh, who, of course, has also taught uh, in UCD uh, many years ago before moving uh, to Edinburgh. Uh, the discussion that we're going to have today uh, is also topical for another reason. Some of you uh, will have followed perhaps the uh, media uh, coverage of a current court case or rather public debate as well as a court case uh, about restitution, about the role of the Royal House of Germany in the rise uh, of the Nazi party. And again, uh, in addition to the book that we're going to talk about today, uh, Stefan has just published a uh, best-selling account of his own involvement in uh, that process in that public debate. Uh, so with that, I'll hand over to Stefan to give us a brief 10-minute uh, introduction to his book and its major themes before uh, he and I will uh, go into discussion and then we'll open the floor to questions. And as Brendan has already mentioned, you can uh, submit uh, your questions through the Q&A function as we go along. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Robert and Brendan. Thank you for having me and thank you for inviting me. I wished I could say it's great to be back in Dublin. This is actually what I planned. Uh, now I cannot really say the sentence because I'm sitting on a chair in my apartment in Berlin. Um, what I'm trying to do is to introduce very briefly in 10 minutes what this book is about, why I wrote it, and why I do think that the nobility is an interesting topic. Actually, this book, Nazis and Nobles History of a Misalliance, and of course the, the word misalliance is, is key here, is something like a shortened rewritten and of course very 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 much improved version of a book I published in 2003. Um, so it, it's, it's, it's a book about um, the relation of the German nobility and the Nazi movement um, and in a broader context and um, the approachment of um, the nobility and the Nazi movement or the extreme right um, in Germany written for an anglophone uh, public, which would not be uh, familiar, or would not be specializing in, in uh, German and German history, but being interested in 20th century German history. Um, the initial point, and why, when I first started looking at the nobility and its history, was actually as an undergraduate student in Berlin, when I came close to uh, the Stauffenberg bomb plot, it is the um, assassination uh, attempt on the 20th of July 1944, which was carried out by a Southwest German nobleman, Count Stauffenberg. And if you study, uh, if you come to study this bomb plot, which is the closest or the moment where German conservatives come the closest to overthrow the entire Nazi regime, um, you will get uh, very, very early to a point to see that some 30 or 40 percent of the people and of the officers being involved in this bomb plot were noblemen, were part of the German nobility. 30 or 40 percent is very impressive because um, the percentage of German uh, nobles in the German population is roughly 0.1, perhaps 0.2 percent. So we are speaking about a very tiny, very small minority in the German uh, society, which makes up for perhaps 90,000, 100,000 uh, people 
in the 20th century. You can compare this, some historians have been doing this, comparing these two minority uh, with the percentage of German Jews living in Germany until 33, the seizure uh, of Hitler's seizure of power in 33, you would reach at roughly 1% of the population and roughly 500,000 people. So why does it make sense? And what is interesting in looking at this very tiny uh, minority of people who theoretically and formally in the German Revolution of 1918, one of course of the most uh, interesting books on the German Revolution has been written by Robert Gerbert, uh, published by Robert Gerbert recently. Uh, so the nobility actually and practically had been abolished uh, by the revolution and its pr last privileges had been abolished by the revolution in November 1918. Now, what does it mean to abolish a nobility? This is something you can learn if you study French history and the French Revolution. You can uh, kill a king and parts of the, of the French um, aristocracy as it happens in the 1790s. It does not mean that you have smashed or crashed or uh, make disappeared uh, the entire nobility. And the nobility tends to be a very long lasting group of people, which is particularly the case in the 20th century uh, of, of Germany. Let me say uh, some words about the, the peculiarities of the nobility and how I try to describe them in the book in the first chapter. So before coming to the points, which is the kernel thing of the book, that is to speak about um, the relationship um, to the Nazi movement and to the extreme right, I try to explain uh, by the tools of cultural history, why being a nobleman or a noblewoman or being part of the nobility and of these ancient families still means something particularly in the 20th century and in the 1920s and 30s uh, in Germany. The German writer and the German poet Heinrich Heine has crafted one of my favorite um, sentences about the nobility uh, where he says, the Jesuits, the devil, and the nobility only exist if we believe in them. So how, how and why is the nobility still there? It is obviously there because many people still believe in it and it's still there. There are hundreds and thousands of autobiographies and texts which are produced by noblemen and noble women after 1918 who try to explain this tremendous loss they have suffered in 1918 and to try to explain to the German public why they are still there and why they are around. They are great storytellers and I think that apart perhaps from Irish people, I've never seen greater storytellers uh, than the German noblemen and, and their autobiographies. And the, this first chapter in the book actually is very much based on, uh, on ego documents and on, on, on how these people portray um, themselves. They portray themselves as being rooted, whereas people uh, like from the bourgeoisie are uprooted people. They try to describe themselves as being very close to nature. This is, of course, referring to the great landowners, particularly in the east of the country, in the east of Prussia. A, uh, if you read uh, texts by, no, by German noblemen, you will learn a lot about their horses, about their dogs, about hunting, about foxes, about deer, etc., cetera, etc., cetera. less about human beings very often. So there is this kind of stylizing themselves and modeling themselves as people being rooted in nature and the rhythms of nature as being opposed to the great cities and particularly as being opposed to Berlin, which is uh, uh, read and interpreted as um, a, a big city run by modernity, by Jews, by the Jewish press, by the Jewish modern theater, etc. Everything which is um, 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 connotated with modernity in the views of the right-wing nobility in Germany is very much linked to Jews. And of course, anti-Semitism from the beginning on is an important bridge between these ancient families and the newly uh, emerging extreme right, which is going to, uh, which is going to be uh, taken over, if you will, by 1930 by, um, by the Nazis. Noblemen then very much speak about family and about time. I remember one of my most impressive conversations I had with a German nobleman, which actually an, an old gentleman who was roughly 90 years old, and we met in a Berlin cafe in the 1990s. And I asked him, why are you buying this estate which, has, which you had lost in 1945 when the Russians came? And why are you now buying this uh, estate back. Are you going to do farming there? And he said, no, I'm, I'm a former diplomat. I'm not. He said, well, will your children do this? And I said, no, they won't. They are bankers and they are somewhere in finance. They said, so why are you buying it? And he said, listen, young man, uh, 
if the children of the children of the children of the children in 200 years time are going to ask me, why didn't you seize this opportunity in 1990 to buy these estates back that we have been owning since 1325? What I'm, am I going to reply to them? So here was I was speaking to a man who was able to travel and back in time to the, to the 14th century, but also forward uh, 200 years. So this idea of the family being a chain of family members who are connected in time, but time in the sense of 200 or 2000 years, whereas most of us can think back to our grandparents or perhaps our grand grandparents, and then normally it would stop. But we are normally not thinking in terms of going 200 years back or 500 years forward. They stylize themselves as uh, forms of warriors, warriorhood, and um, uh, um, the military performance is extremely uh, important against the bourgeois culture or about what conservatives in Germany call the chattering classes. So we would be part of the chattering classes, people who are interested in books, who have university training, and who are what in German is called the Bildungsbürgertum. So this could be lawyers or university professors, for example. So all this is connotated in a very negative way, um, whereas warriordom and this kind of uh, fighting in the trenches and the performance of officers in the war in the First World War becomes very important in these texts. Leadership is another key idea, and of course, leadership and the word Führer in German, which is I still think impossible to, to correct to to uh, accurately translate into English because it means more than leader. It is connotated to military and very ancient ideas of warriordom. So this idea of Führer, Führertum, leadership becomes a key word, a buzzword, uh, very important in the entire extreme right, and by which I mean the intellectual right, the bourgeois right, and this form of nobility. And th these different groups form new forms of, of blends, which then um, lead to uh, this form of, uh, of, uh, of closeness to the nodes. So I guess that in the discussion, we're going to speak more closely about um, about uh, this really this complex relationship uh, between nobles and um, Nazis. Let me perhaps just add two or three sentences. The main part of the book is about this very twisted path that the nobility took took uh, towards um, towards the uh, the Nazi movement. It's a very contradictory uh, relationship. It ends up. And this is the result of the book, which is perhaps not astonishing, but um, the way this very complex relation is played out is quite interesting. Uh, the result of this misalliance is that larger parts of um, particularly the Prussian Protestant nobility are going to be very uh, at a very early point, very close to the Nazi movement and become part of the Nazi movement, whereas other parts of the German nobility, particularly in South Germany and particularly in the, in the Catholic parts of the German nobility, uh, tend to uh, remain uh, much closer to conservative and non-Nazi uh, uh, rules and patterns and try to keep up a distance which a larger part and the largest part of the Prussian nobility loses over time during the 1920s and 30s. Perhaps this is an introduction and perhaps we go into more detail, Robert, by uh, throughout your questions. Excellent, uh, Stefan. Thanks so much uh, for this uh, great uh, introduction to the book, which I, of course, recommend uh, to all of you because it uh, explores, I think, in a very convincing way, a uh, complex relationship, as you've said. Um, now, one question, um, perhaps a good point to start, uh, would be uh, to talk a little bit more about the place of the German nobility in um, in Germany before the revolution of 1918, just to get a better sense of uh, how steep the fall was um, caused by that revolution that would ultimately, if I read your book correctly, uh, lead to a path of radicalization that would see many um, members of the nobility support the Nazi movement, despite the fact uh, that from a sociological point of view, in terms of social background, in terms of snobbism, um, they would not naturally be inclined to support someone like Hitler, who came out of nowhere, was not even German, um, and had a little sort of social 
cachet that would convince them, whereas their world is very elitist. So how can we explain, uh, first of all, the sort of the, the place of the aristocracy uh, in Germany before 1918 in a uh, constitutional parliamentary uh, monarchy? Yeah, um, um, thank you. I guess perhaps the starting point for professional historians is to, the theory around the German Sonderweg, the special, the so-called special path, uh, which was one of the most powerful narratives in German or in historiography about Germany in the 1970s, 80s, which basically started or one prerequisite or one main theory and point of this theory about the German special path was to say that the German nobility was not really smashed as opposed to other countries. So if you look at Ireland, if you look at Great Britain, if you look at Italy, if you look, of course, at France or at the Bolshevik Revolution in Russia, you will find European civilizations where the nobility, of course, existed also in all of these countries, but somehow uh, further, sooner or later was uh, um, 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 smashed at an earlier point, France being probably the most important and most interesting example, because as I said, it never really disappears even in France, and even in France in the 20th century, it is still there. So look, coming back to Germany, the, germ, the, the, the peculiarity of German history until 1918, until the fall of the Kaiserreich and until the, from a German perspective, catastrophe of the Lost World War in 1918 is that the part that the nobility is extremely strong. And particularly in Prussia, it is extremely strong. And there are some strongholds which have to be mentioned in order to uh, highlight where they are. So they're not strong in finance. They're almost absent in banking. They're absent in industry. So as opposed to, for example, the British, the, Eng the, English, the English gentry, yeah, the English gentry, which in the 18th, 19th century starts to invest into spheres and into the milieu, which is supposed to be bourgeois, that is finance, that is the empire, and that is banking, that is trade. The Prussian nobility has a tendency to stay with wheat, with farming, with land, with land estates, and very, very importantly, the army. So uh, in 1914, in 1918, we could say that everything which is important, the, 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 the highest officer ranks, generals and the higher officer, officer corps in the army, that's a bit different in the navy, is run by science of the great old German families. So army, uh, the, 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 the big estates, uh, diplomacy, uh, the ministries are more or less dominated by this pseudo anti capitalist, anti modern uh, milieu or fa families, uh, this very tiny minority in a country, the Kaiserreich, the German Empire, which by all means is part of the most modern and most dynamic industrial states in 1914, 1918. So, this kind of clash that you have between an extremely modern state um, and uh, the guys running it having values and having uh, still uh, a mindset from other uh, times or from the, the Middle Ages is a kind of thing. So what happens in 1918 is the entire German society drops from quite high to very low. But I think it's a sure bet to say that there's no group in the entire German nobility that falls from a comparable height to a comparable low. Yeah, they are not decapitated, they're not killed. They're even keeping their titles and their names. They're even keeping their estates and castles. This is not Jacobinism. This is not 1793 in France, but they are losing and they're losing in their own self-perception. Their own self-perception, 1918 is the big catastrophe um, and if you, I mean, if you compare it uh, as what social historians would do, and partly I consider myself to be one, a worker who had been working in an in, in a factory in Bochum in 1913, and would be fighting in the trenches and survive the war and come back, he would do what? He would go back to the factory and work in the factory in Bochum. His life would not radically change. Or if you're a German duke, or if you're the German king, or if you're the Bavarian king, or if you're the Count of Arnim in Brandenburg, you fall from very, very high to very, very low. And this, this position of uh, uh, this extreme disdain, and I think I would call it hatred, this extreme hatred that these people have against the Republic from the first day on, hatred against the Republic, against democracy, against parliamentarism, against the press, 
uh, against socialists, against unionists, against communists, uh, against feminists, against modern theater and literature. Um, and of course, all of this held together in their perception by the Jews. Um, and immediately, and this goes back a longer way into the late 19th century, this is loaded up or uploaded with mod modern forms of anti-Semitism. So what we have is a self-perceived Armageddon, a catastrophe, which actually, if we look at it from here, say, hey, but you were all still there. You were alive. You even had your castle and you even have your horses. So what's really the problem? But in the self-perception of these families, it is a catastrophe and they are reacting to it with ressentiment with hatred, with aggressivity, and with a form of political radicalization. And let me mention one last uh, number in order to make this. I said the army is run uh, basically by Prussian nobility. It's of course also the people losing the war, right? But the story that they are telling and the step of the back legend is the war was actually already won in the East, Eastern Front anyhow, and in the Western Front also. Then the Social Democrats and the Socialists came and the Jews came and murdered the winning soldiers. So these people being responsible for the war and for uh, the German defeat of 1918, uh, there are roughly 10,000 um, officers, uh, there, there, there are roughly 10,000 noble officers in the, in, the, in the Empire Army, in the Imperial Army 1918. This is shrinking through the, tre the, the Treaty of the, the, the Versailles Treaty to a number of 900 uh, noble officers in the so-called Reichswehr, so in the Army of the Republic. So they fall from 10,000 to 900 which means that they are losing one of the most important position they had in order to put their sons in, yeah, because the, the oldest son normally traditionally is inheriting the estate and the younger sons are going to have a position in the army. This, this, this is lost. And one of the key reasons, if you read the story economically, is interpreting the Nazis and the planned war in the East, which is clear from a very early point on, is that the Nazis and the next war, because the question for, for, for most noblemen is not if there's going to be a war, but only when it is going to start and how it's going to be fought and if it is going to be won. Um, conquering land in the East, um, and this goes back a very, very long way to the 13th or 12th century and to, to the Teutonic Knights, and this idea of conquering colonial land and to win 2,000, 5,000 or 10,000 hectares in Ukraine or in Belorussia or even deeper in, 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 the, in the Russian uh, uh, space is something which is a very highly attractive model for all the landed families who have lost the positions in the army and who partly are suffering from the general economic crisis which is hitting the German agriculture very severely from 1924 on. Yeah, that's uh, really fascinating. I mean, one uh, thing that always struck me is that after 1918, after the, the German Revolution, um, monarchism in Germany is dead. And uh, you have also argued that uh, part of the explanation uh, for the end of monarchism in Germany um, hangs with the behavior of a man we haven't talked about at all yet, uh, the German Kaiser, Wilhelm II, who uh, ruled over Imperial Germany. Uh, for the last uh, 20 years of its existence, uh, who led Germany into the First World War. So, uh, and of course, who, who actually lives to see at least part of the Second World War, the rise of the Nazis, etc. cetera. Um, so let's talk about Wilhelm uh, for a moment, about his um, uh, behavior at the end of the First World War, and then his kind of changing attitudes towards Nazism. Yeah, talking about Wilhelm is always a good idea, especially there's so many of them in German history, but actually we would have to talk about three Wilhelms here because there's William II, which is the Kaiser, uh, his oldest son, the crown prince, Wilhelm, and the oldest son of the crown prince, Wilhelm II. So we have three generations of Wilhelms here, um, and all of the three Wilhelms are going to be quite close um, to the Nazi movement from a certain moment on. But to start with the downfall of the, of the most important Wilhelm, the Kaiser, uh, the, the, in the military headquarters in the, on the 8th and 9th November 1918, at the very end of the, of the World War, there are different conceptions about what the Kaiser could do. One conception is uh, he could somehow gather his last 
faithful officers and trying a counter-revolutionary march on Berlin, which is something like 600 kilometers away in the east, and he would have to cross the Rhine bridges, which are already held by revolutionary uh, soldiers. The second conception is that he could somehow try to negotiate with the allies, which probably at this point would have led to a situation where Wilhelm and his son would have been captured by the allies, and there would have been a trial either in Paris or in London. He's, of course, trying, he's not very keen on, on choosing this solution. There's a third revolution, there's a third option, uh, which is looking for suicide on the battlefield, which is actually an option that some of his younger officers, front officers, are suggesting or discussing. He basically discussed that he should sit on a horse uh, together with his sons and together with a smaller group of uh, higher generals or officers and ride into the artillery fire and try to seek death on the battlefield which in the reading of these officers is the only way in order to get out in an honorable uh, uh, way out, out of this defeat and to leave a heritage um, to German monarchism or to, to Prussian monarchism, which then could rebuild a kind of kingdom later. The fact that he doesn't do this and that he is choosing option number four, which is fleeing from the military headquarters and sitting in a car and on a train and crossing the, do the border to the Netherlands at night, and then living uh, in exile uh, in a, a little castle called uh, Dorn, that's a place called to Utrecht in, in Holland. And he's going to live there until 1941. He dies uh, in summer 1941, uh, some weeks before uh, Operation Barbarossa, so some weeks before the Germans are attacking the Soviet Union, being completely enthusiastic about Hitler and his performances, etc. By this time, and it starts around 1930, 1931. He has tried to build an alliance with the Nazis because he's hoping that the Nazis would bring back the Kaiser. And the Nazis are clever enough to send Göring over to Holland and he's meeting the Kaiser, he's, they're having dinner. Uh, Wilhelm at an early point, 1922, is, is, is married, his is wife, so the, the Empress is die, dies in 1920. Only a year and a half later, he um, remarries with a woman who is 30 years younger than himself, younger than his, his oldest son. And this second wife is a very convinced national socialist at a very early point. She is mobile. So where is he is fixed in the, in the Netherlands in his castle because he's not allowed to go back to Germany. She is driving around in Munich, in Potsdam, in Bochum, and she is meeting people of the, the high nobility, the leaders of the conservative party, the mightiest landowners, the high, uh, the high ranking officers. She's meeting Hitler, Göring, Goebbels. And she is very much, I wouldn't call this responsible, but she plays an important role in building this bridge to, um, in, in order to build this bridge between the Kaiser who is still, sitting in this castle and if you read this text it's a man who is manically uh, like a, uh, in a manic way producing tens or hundreds of pages every day a twaddle full of anti-semitism hatred of it. i mean this is really fascinating stuff a lot of it is published um, or described by John Röhl in English. So if you read the third volume of John Röhl's uh, William II biography, you will find this. So this is the Kaiser. Now his son, the crown prince, who is actually in, in, in the focus of a very uh, heated debate in Germany currently, the oldest son, the crown prince, follows his father in 1918. There's also a concept that he, like his father, should look for an honorable war on the battlefield. He doesn't do this. He is rather uh, spending time with his French mistresses in a villa uh, behind uh, um, um, in the front lines, which becomes a problem because the officers know it and in the trenches, the soldiers are telling stories about it, which then go back, reach Germany and in Germany people are speaking, our fathers and our sons and our brothers are killed in the trenches while the crown prince who is formerly the commander, the Befehlshaber, uh, um, the commander of um, the, the, the most important German army group, which is named after him, Heeresgruppe Kronprinz. He, at the same time, is spending his time and his nights uh, with his French uh, young mistresses, which actually is reality. This is not only rumor, it's reality. Um, so this man does what he does, then he flees to Holland, lives in exile on a, a tiny, Dutch island where he spends almost five years. 
And if you're familiar with Homer and with Ulysses and with how, I mean, I'm, I'm not meaning the, the Irish Ulysses, but the original Greek one, um, and how he comes back after exile, after the, the war of Troy, and then he finds, uh, he will travel back to his wife Penelope and find her in his, uh, his home. So the king, and this is a very, very powerful figure in German history and in German mythology. Kiffhäuser is um, a, a mountain somewhere in the center of Germany, where according to German legends going back to the Middle Ages, or you could say back to the Bible and to Homer, where the king is sleeping inside the mountain. And one day the king is going to go out of the mountain and there are going to be special signs indicating it's the right moment and the king is going to come back. Every German schoolboy of every German grammar school is familiar with these kind of stories. So the nobility abolished, yes, formally, the kings being abolished and no longer there, yes, but the idea of the king coming back is a very powerful idea. You will later get this as a narrative of the Führer coming back. Yeah, you will have a, com a, a competition between the Kaiser being still there, his son, the crown prince, being back around in Germany, alive and kicking, and Hitler and other extreme right-wing Führer figuren, so these Führer figures, which the Führer and the king is not the same thing. They are in competition. And if you read German history from the perspective of, let's say, 1925 or 1927, it is not at all certain that Hitler is going to win this game at the end. Hitler in 1927 is a nobody. Uh, he's a guy from Austria who had a painting postcards. So the idea that Hitler one day would somehow outrun the Prussian kings and princes is completely absurd. Yeah, we are used because history is written by the victors. And, the, and the, the history of the German right is also written by the victors. That, is, that means we are used to fix and to focus on the Nazis, but in the 1920s, this is an open story. So uh, just to, to sum this up, the crown prince comes back to Germany in 1923. This is organized by Gustav Stresemann, a monarchist uh, minister, the most powerful minister for a time until his death in 29 of the Republic. He's a monarchist. He uh, travels to this island and arranges secretly the, the, re, the return of the king, uh, to say it with Tolkien, uh, Tolkien's, uh, I think, last volume, The Return of the King, very powerful story. And he comes back. And there's a kind of general perception and, 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 and uh, a perception of the situation that indeed this king, either the Kaiser or his son is going to, back to, to take back um, the throne. And you can read this in, in the Irish Times in the 19, around 1932. It's in the London Times, it is in the New York Times, it is even in the South uh, China Morning Star. So worldwide, you have a global perception of looking at these kings and what they're doing. I was very astonished to learn uh, recently how much the Hohenzollern, the royal family, are looked at in the American uh, in the American press, for example. And to finish this, there is the third Wil Wilhelm, so the, the 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 third generation, the son of the crown prince, who is going to be killed on the Western Front in France in May 1940. So there are there's six, six, six sons. And one of the reason of German, of the, of the weakness of German monarchy, and this is key in order to understand the success of the Nazis later. The monarchy needs a king, right? A monarchy without a king is a bad thing. And a monarchy which at the same time has two, five, six, or 20 different candidates all competing for the throne, and this is the German situation in the 1920s, is going to be a very weak monarchy. And this, this very fact that there is some kind of a vacuum and that the Prussian monarchy being unable to, to even to define its pretender, yeah, the right-wing monarchists of the older generation are unable to define, do they mean the Kaiser, do they mean the crown prince, or do they mean the son of the crown prince, or perhaps the younger brothers of the crown prince, or perhaps even, you know, uh, uh, someone from the Hanover family. So there are several candidates, and in this crucial time, and I would define this between 1930, 1930 and 1933, there are two or three years of competition, which will end up in the result that we all know, which is the so-called seizure of power or the handover of power to the Nazis um, and, 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 and to Hitler, because in a way, because the monarchs and the, the Hohenzollern couldn't make it. And because the, the kind of, of loyalty that this family was still able to, 
together in the German population became weaker and weaker, whereas the loyalty and the momentum that the Nazis could develop everywhere, they had a better story. They also had a better story because Hitler was not fleeing. Hitler was, Hitler had this, the street cred, it's a very good uh, English word. Hitler had a kind of street cred from the trenches that none of the Hohenzollern family could bring back. They were doing other things behind the front. No, they were talking about warriordom, but no one of them was a warrior. Whereas Hitler had this kind of, of thing, I shared this, uh, I shared this combat experience with you. I, I lost my eyesight through uh, British or Jewish or whatever he would say in Mein Kampf, ga gas attacks. I know what you are talking about. I am incorporating and symbolizing the heroic fighting of the German people. This is exactly the kind of narrative that neither the crown prince nor the Kaiser nor any of his sons nor any other person of the German high nobility could, could display. Shadow, we already have a couple of questions in the Q&A, but before uh, I will read those out, uh, let me just finish up uh, with one more question about the, the curious current situation. Perhaps you could say what uh, this debate in Germany, but also the, the legal quarrel, uh, is all about. Uh, it is about one of the Wilhelms uh, and the question to what extent he supported um, Hitler's ascent to power uh, prior to 1933 and uh, what your role in all of this is. So just for people who may not have uh, followed the news um, about this debate, which is pretty big in Germany right now. Mm -hmm. Uh, it, uh, it's a very complex thing, and I try to, to, to bring this into, into a, a few, in, into a couple of minutes. Um, you have to start with 1940, 1945, Germany losing, Nazi Germany losing the Second World War, and the Red Army, the Soviets occupying what later is going to be the Soviet occupied zone and then become communist Germany in 1949. The first thing that the communists do and that the Soviets do was to expropriate all the great landowners in the East, especially when they were noble, because the communist reading of fascism, as they call it, or of national socialism, was that the landowners, and particularly the, the noble landowners, were very important pillars of fascism in Germany. So destroying the landowners, which actually the revolution of 1919 had failed to do, because come, the communists didn't make it. Now this is the second chance. And what the Russians do is expropriating these um, um, estates, castles, manor houses, uh, art objects, everything. 45 years later, 1990, German reunification. And after the German reunification, there is a possibility for all German families or individuals who had property in the communist part of Germany to claim a part of their property back. This is what the former uh, royal family, the Hohenzollern family is doing from the early 1990s on. And this is a debate and a, qu and a quarrel which has now been, been going on, if you will, the, for, for 30 years. And it opposes the former German royal family, the Hohenzollern family on the one hand and the German state on the other hand. Um, and the, now where the Nazi history comes into play is that German legislation in 1994 has voted a very complex law which says only persons can uh, claim this, this compensation who have not supported the Nazi regime. So if, if there was a substantial support, this is what the law says, in the case of sub substantial support for the regime, you're not entitled to get any compensation or money back. So the, the question is now, did the Crown Prince, Crown Prince Wilhelm, because he was the owner at the time, uh, at the time of the expropriation in 45, did he support the Nazis or not? Um, the Hohenzollern family first charged uh, Christopher Clark, who is the Regis Professor of History at Cambridge University. So one of the, I would say the most popular and, and one also one of the best uh, historians of German history. And he came up with a shorter text saying basically, no, the Crown Prince didn't. At this time in 19, uh, at this point in 2014, I had been contacted by the German Ministry of Finance or in, in Potsdam, the Brandenburg Ministry of Finance, if I were interested in writing a, a text and looking at the things again, I did this, I produced the text of 100 pages. 
then it comes into a very long story where the family has been attacking me with, with lawyers and I've been um, standing or I'm currently still standing at uh, in different court trials um, against the lawyers of the current Prince of Prussia who is accusing me to have uh, to have published falsehoods or false state statements about uh, about his claims. This is this is an, another is a sub thing in in the greater debate. So this is an ongoing debate now, where you have the confrontation between different historians. It has been in the German Bundestag, so in the German Parliament. It has been in the Berliner Senat, which is the local or the re regional Parliament um, of of, of um, Berlin. I have been contacted by uh, A-level students who were writing emails to, to me because they have been chosen it as their uh, um, oral exam in, in, in the history exams um, in the German Abiturprüfung, the A-levels prüfung uh, in, in Germany. Um, it is in all leading German media and there are several books published about it. And it's an interesting thing because it Formally, we are discussing about the behavior of one man, which is the crown prince, a quite insignificant person. But doing so is an occasion, and this make, makes this, this, this debate quite interesting, or at least I wrote a book of almost 800 pages about it, so obviously I must find it, it, it interesting. It's, it's a form of rereading of German history of the 20th century, and particularly it's a rereading of German conservatism and of the very old question, one of the oldest questions uh, that we have in German history, and I would say one of the most important vanishing points in German history, which is the 30s, uh, January 1933, the seizure of power or Hitler uh, being made uh, chancellor of the, um, the last chancellor of the Republic and the question who was responsible for it. So it's a rereading of one of the oldest um, 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 debates in German, in German history, who made the Third Reich, who was running the Third Reich, and to, how do we explain the political mechanisms and responsibilities in terms of political history, and how do we use cultural and social history in order to explain the different incentives and the different motivations of players who had contributed to it. And in, into this thing, you always get the 20th of July, you always get the bomb plot and the mentioned bomb of Stauffenberg or the second bomb, which unfortunately didn't go off because it was not, it was missing in, the, in Stauffenberg's uh, suitcase. And the question did the Hohenzollern, because this is partly what the lawyers or what the defenders of the family are claiming or saying that parts of the family were close to the German resistance or were contributing to the German resistance and the 20th July. So I would say this is a very, very old story, but it is told from a perspective which, strangely enough, most German historians have um, forgotten to tell. The nobility somehow is under flying or flies underneath the radar of the Republicans, which is valid for the 1920s, in, in the 1920s, the German left liberals and the German social democrats, they do not really understand what the nobles are doing. They do not really understand that if you're a nobleman, you're not communicating in a newspaper or in the parliament, but deer hunting and the officer's casino is the place uh, to go of communication. And this form of misunderstanding, of not understanding of, of noble culture and what these people are and how they think and how they speak and how they dress, um, and how they look at the world and how it is different from most other people, uh, I think very interestingly is, uh, or has been, it's, it's my, uh, it's the only way to explain why we have so few books on the German nobility. If you look at explanations that the greatest, the most important books on, on the Weimar Republic and the Third Reich and the making of the Third Reich, everybody somehow mentions the nobility, but very, very, very few historians have been empirically working about the nobility. I could name five or six worldwide, five or six, seven living historians who have been empirically working about the topic. And that's quite interesting in a field where everything has been looked at, or almost everything. That's fascinating, and we'll be following uh, that uh, ongoing uh, debate from over here, and I'm, I'm hoping that it will be reported on in the uh, news as well. Um, I will now move to questions uh, from the audience. There are quite a few, actually, so I'll have to shorten some of them. One uh, here that I see on my screen is about uh, Adam von Trotzl-Solitz, uh, of course, a central figure uh, in the 
shall we say, conservative resistance, uh, who, whose widow uh, came to Ireland. And uh, she, still in the 1990s, um, could not quite understand why British uh, aristocrats uh, had never come to understand Adam's position about, uh, you know, the bomb plot of 1944 being a kind of offer to the British uh, and particularly the aristocrats in the Foreign Office uh, to, well, realign, shall we say, the war effort against uh, the real enemy, um, the, uh, the Bolsheviks or communists, um, the Red Army, which was much more threatening, of course, to that particular social class uh, than the Nazis would have been. Mm -hmm. Yeah, very good question and very important. This is the other side, if you will, the, the, the bright side of the German or particularly the, the Prussian nobility. Trotz Zolt being surely one of the most impressive uh, members of the Prussian nobility and not by chance does he have this um, English connection and a co connection to English training and English universities, English family, which is also valid or true for other members of the Prussian nobility uh, playing more or less important roles in the bomb plot or in the planning of what then becomes the bomb plot of the 20s of July, being opponents of the Nazis at a very early point, which is the case for uh, Trotz Solz. It is also the case, I think one, I think the, the person, the figure who impressed me most in the German nobility uh, would be Helmut James, um, Count Moltke, who again has, through South Africa, very close um, connections to England, to Britain. It is also valid to York von Wartenburg. So there are three, four, five, six, there might be a group of 20 people that you could name who either as officers or as trained lawyers, which is the case also for Trotz Solz um, and, and for Moltke, as trained lawyers and from being faithful to the, well, the values which were once uh, important in the Prussian nobility are defending these positions in very impressive ways and who indeed are trying to contact British, American and other uh, uh, countries on a very uh, early point. They, they are on quite lonely positions and indeed misunderstood. And I think also misunderstood from the British side and from the American side as probably agents or spies of the Nazis. And of course, there's a kind of uh, disdain from the British and from the Americans saying, oh, these are just Juncker. These are just, uh, these, it's just a bunch of German reactionary Prussian officers and they're terribly wrong in misinterpreting, in, in misinterpreting um, these men. And so I, I, this is, by the way, which I try in this book, I write in, an, I, I try to write, or I didn't try, I did write an entire chapter about, of course, the resistance and these, I call them renegades, renegades in the sense of, they are even more impressive. A, a man like Trot von Solz or Count Moltke or Count uh, uh, York are even more impressive if you compare them to their own families and to what the bearers of their names are doing in their majority. So there's this smaller part, this tiny part within the Prussian nobility um, organizing surely the most uh, heartbreaking and impressive forms uh, of resistance. If you read their letters and the texts that they have left, uh, I'm thinking of Moltke's letters that he uh, writes uh, in a Gestapo prison to, to his wife, for example. These are very, very impressive um, um, documents documenting the better parts of German conservatism, uh, partly you could say German cons conservative liberalism, and the greater parts of, of Prussian tradition, which the majority of the nobility had been betraying in the 1920s. Given our limitations on time, I'm going to group some of the questions here together. I think there are some interesting questions here on uh, differentiation within uh, the nobility. I mean, are there, is it, are we talking about different attitudes towards Nazism when we're looking at the Prussian nobility versus, say, the Bavarian nobility? Uh, are there differences between uh, Catholic and uh, Protestant noblemen? Uh, I think that's quite an important, uh, these are important questions to understand sort of nuances uh, when we're talking about aristocratic attitudes towards Nazism. 
Right. Yeah, again, a very good, a very good question. So, of course, speaking about vulnerability is somehow permissible. If you have 20 minutes in the book, uh, I try to differentiate this um, much more, uh, much more on the text. It is indeed the most important, I think, dividing line between Protestant and Catholics uh, in, in, within the nobility. And this ties in with other um, differentiations in other groups where you also have the same difference between Catholics and Protestants. So the Nazi voters and the Nazi members, we have this dividing line between Protestants and, uh, and Catholics and the Catholic milieu is one of two milieus I would name, the, the, the second one being organized socialist and communist workers, and the, the, the Catholic milieu in the south of Germany and in the western part, so Westphalia, for example, would be another, uh, another example, is much more resistant against um, the thing. And this can be explained, it's a complex thing, but to make, to cut a very long story short, I would name three things that the Bavarian Catholics do have, as opposed to the Prussians. First, they have money. In a sense, they have more money. They have more preserved their estates. It has agricultural reasons. It has to do with uh, inheritance patterns. But th the first reason is they are still richer. They do not fall as deep as the most of the Prussian families do. The second thing is they have a king, which is the Bavarian crown prince, a guy called Ruprecht, who had been a quite able uh, army uh, general in the, in the First World War, is still there. And what I described for Prussia, we have 30 different candidates, and the problem of monarchists is you have to go by the personnel who's there. You can't like you can't go into the, the, the Führer supermarket and pick the most uh, apt uh, Führer. You can do this if you're a Republican. You can't do this if you're a monarchist. So the, 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 the Bavarians still have very clearly a, a, a pretender to the throne, Crown Prince Ruprecht. So they have money, they have a Crown Prince, and thirdly, they have, they have the Pope, that is the Pope meaning Catholicism, meaning the Vatican, meaning uh, Catholic teaching for uh, the Catholic noblemen or young boys and girls go to other institutions, to other schools, they re read different texts. They are much, much less linked to the German army. So this extreme orientation towards the army that I was speaking about only refers to Prussia. It does not refer uh, uh, to Bavaria. So much more of them are, they would be, let's say it's at least possible, it's, you can consider a career in banking or a career at a university or even a career in the arts, which is still extremely impossible, if not uh, extremely difficult, if not impossible uh, within, within Prussian uh, uh, families. So this is the most important dividing line. And you could, of course, uh, play the gender game and, and say men and women, one of the most uh, one of the findings I was most surprised with in my own book when I found this out is how much women are overrepresented. So this uh, um, German noble women are very, very highly overrepresented in the Nazi party. This is difficult to explain. I still have, I don't have a clear explanation to it, but that's another finding. And then of course, generation is also a, a, a game that you could play. And then you would find that it's more, and this is not astonishing because it corresponds to the general pattern. It's more the younger generation. It's the so-called Kriegsjugendgeneration. That means the young people born around 1900 being too young to have fought in the trenches and trying to find ways of winning their wars, of, of winning the war that their fathers and older brothers had lost uh, on the Western Front. So this generation of young people who has no loyalty and particularly uh, affinity to the kings, they're just these people are cowards, they left us. And their orientation uh, is, is quite, uh, is much earlier towards the extreme right, and then through the Nazis being the most powerful part of the German extreme right. Another question here, and I realize we're coming uh, to the end of our time, but I think it's an important one. And I apologize to all those who submitted questions that we couldn't uh, answer. I'm sure uh, if you sent them to uh, Stefan by email, he'd be very happy to uh, respond to you. Um, but the, uh, the question that I was going to put to you is how did Hitler view the nobility? Because you touched upon that very briefly, uh, but I don't think you've resolved quite yet why uh, Hitler did not allow uh, the Kaiser back as a sort of titular uh, Hitler figure, if you like. Yeah, uh, so this starts out, I would <coughs> I'd say, with Mein Kampf, 
uh, written when Hitler is imprisoned uh, in uh, after the, the the failing putsch in, in 23, and he has this time to dictate or to write Mein Kampf. And in Mein Kampf, there are several passages about nobility, which are very negative. And he draws actually the picture of decadent people being full of Jewish blood, as he calls it, which, which is an obsession that goes on in the German nobility, that they would be all somehow have Jewish blood in their veins, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so the, the short question, the short answer to the question is this is a very negative um, image that he inherits from the so-called Völkisch movement, because even in the 1890s or around 1900, the extreme anti-Semitic right that develops in Germany and in, in Imperial Germany is parts of it extre extremely anti-noble, anti-aristocratic. So Hitler inherits this, but then at the same time, if you look at who were the people who taught him to eat with a fork and a knife and who uh, brought him into contact with the leading elites in Munich, you have noblemen around there, and he's going to take a very cynical standpoint, a very ambivalent one, and he is going to be open enough in order to give to signal out to the German nobility, if you're working with us, if you're accepting our racist and anti-Semitic prerequisites of our ideology, and if you actually participate in what we call Volksgemeinschaft, which is the main keyword of the Nazi ideology, the people's community. There's a place in the people's community uh, that, that the people community is holding for you, the nobility. And this is, uh, this is open and ambivalent enough for many uh, German noblemen uh, to, to go into this direction. Actually, if you read the texts, and this is still astonishing me, I, I still think, how could you be so stupid and so blind not to see that this was a misalliance. Nobility means inequality. There's no, there's no, there, there's no Volksgemeinschaft. There's no people's community. If you are born as a count and you want to define yourself as a count, it is about inequality. Whereas the Nazi ideology is based on the idea that all German members of the Volksgemeinschaft are equal and the dividing lines are racist and anti-Semite and come from different places, but they are not combinable with how the, 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 how the nobility had been defining itself for the last 2000 years. Stefan, it's been a fascinating conversation and uh, undoubtedly we could continue for quite some time given the number of uh, questions and comments I have here. Um, at this point, I can uh, only offer a virtual round of applause uh, for this and encourage everyone uh, to buy the book, which is an excellent contribution uh, to the field. And with that, I will hand over uh, back to Brendan. Well, thank you very much, uh, Stefan and Robert. Uh, I found it a fascinating conversation. And